Today, we're gonna tell you why Shigeru Miyamoto, who has created Mario and Zelda, Donkey Kong, made tons and tons and billions and billions of dollars on the Mario movie, is so obsessed with the Pikmin series. Why? Yeah, we have been playing and enjoying the Pikmin 4 demo, and it's made us think back to the history of the series. And again, look, Mr. Miyamoto seems to have this singular obsession with Pikmin that's got it to this point where it is now. We're going to dig into that deeper today. Yeah. It is a very interesting thing because he has so many, like, check marks on his belt that he would be obsessed with something like Pikmin. So, yes, we will dig into the history of all of that. And as always, everything that we do on this channel is made possible by our wonderful Patreon family. Thank you so much for all of your support. Yeah, you know, we do uh, a number of um, Patreon questions and answers as a segment in every episode of this podcast. What if I told you we had a whole other piece of content that was nothing but questions and answers? That is something that you can get exclusively as a Patreon member of Kit and Krista. That's right. We have bonus Q&As where you get the juicy questions and answers from us. We actually save a lot of our more um, controversial questions, I think, for our bonus Q&A because we know that we are in the circle of trust with our wonderful Patreon family. So if you want to get in on that, consider joining us at patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. There's lots of other benefits as well, including early access to this podcast and be part of our wonderful Discord server every day. Someone tells me on Discord that this is the best Discord they've ever been a part of. We get up to some shenanigans up there, and it's really fun. So, yeah, join us. It's a good time. So we have some fun new stuff that's up on our YouTube channel that you all should check out. Uh, we posted your solo video of your trip to the Game Awards concert, which I really like. I think you think it's weird. I like I watching stuff that you do yourself or, like, when you guest on something else. And, like, I'm not there. I Like, I really like watching that for some reason. Why? I don't know. It's like, I, I don't get the opportunity to watch as a fan of you, which I am big fan. Um, <laughs> because it's like when we're doing this, it's like, well, that's a different thing. But it's like, oh, yes, I can just watch Krista doing it. Krista stuff. Yes, I like this. Okay. Well, that if you want to watch Krista doing Krista stuff, I did go to Los Angeles to attend the Game Awards 10 year anniversary concert. And there's a vlog of that up. It was actually really fun because on that trip, I stayed in a different neighborhood than we normally do. We usually stay downtown because that's when we were at Nintendo. Obviously, we go to, you know, L.A. for E3 stuff and it always be next to the LACC. So downtown, I think we know pretty well. And honestly, downtown is like hit or miss. <laughs> um, so it was kind of nice to stay in a different neighborhood. I stayed um, like in West Hollywood this time right along where all the Los Angeles museums were. So I actually got to be like a bit of a tourist for the day. So that was really fun. Like I honestly have never been to any of those museums and I go to, hmm. I've been to LA like so many times as you know, for business trips or for other trips, I've, n I've never gone to um, like the LACMA, which is so weird and awful. Like this is why people think like, Oh, you get to travel everywhere. It's like so cool. It's like, no, it's not that glamorous. You just, sit in the hotel room and work so it's not that fun but this time I was like oh my gosh I get to like be a tourist for a little bit and um it was really nice I enjoyed it I have taken Mr. Miyamoto to one of those museums I think on a trip where he was talking about Pikmin to the point of this episode so yeah that's crazy <laughs> wow. that you hadn't been to those but those are really fun yeah. um speaking so we've seen Krista doing Krista stuff soon you'll be able to watch Kit doing Kit stuff that's now I'm right. referring to myself in the third person, so it's time to officially like get worked. Like yes. a weirdo. Like a weirdo. Yeah. I you... am still here in Taiwan. I, this is my last mm. couple of days. By the time this is out, depending on when you're listening to it, I may be back, actually. Um, but I, over the last couple of days, have set out on my mission to explore the gaming scene in Taiwan and Taipei in specific. And uh, I'm glad to say that it has been a resounding success. Um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I think you should watch the video, but they have an underground mall. Underground! Yeah. Asian goes, malls, man. It goes for like over a mile. And I have walked the entire mall and found some really cool stuff um, that we're working on putting together into a video for all of you. So 
uh, if you want to see what it's like, uh, the gaming scene in another country uh, in Asia that is not Japan, uh, I think you will not want to miss this one. Yeah, it is so cool to see the gaming scene in other countries. Like, you never know what to expect, what games are really popular in that country. Um, So, yes, I have secretly been watching all of the – you uploaded, like, 50-plus videos. There was a lot of videos. Of – of you exploring the gaming scene in the underground, quite literally gaming scene in Taiwan, not very much underground, literally, but um, it was really cool and we're putting it together. But yeah, I, I've never seen that before. So it was kind of cool to just like have a little peekaboo into what other countries are into when it comes to gaming. It's so, it's so interesting. One, one of the little thing that's been interesting to see is I, I don't know the history of games in Taiwan super well. So it's been interesting to see like in some of the shops that have retro stuff, like where the transition point was to we're just importing things from Japan and everything is in Japanese to, you know, now this is actually a dedicated market and they have their own ratings on the games. Mm, Uh, The stuff is in Chinese because yeah, the like, with a lot of gaming companies, Japan is a dedicated market. And then they just kind of look at a lot of the rest of Asia as the other market. So it's been interesting to see as I like go through the different generations in these retro stores, like when did that happen with different, different, you know, uh, console companies and and different generations? I wonder if there's any dedicated development done in Taiwan. Um, Like, do they have their own studios out there or is there, is there anything like that? Like, I just, I'm curious, but. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I've been hearing from a few different people that I just missed um, when I came here, one of the really, one of the biggest gaming trade shows in the world, actually. So that oh. would have been cool to, to see, but I just missed it by a couple of days. So yeah, it's a, it's oh, a, it's a, bad. it's a gaming scene that you don't often hear about, but I think is secretly really big from what I've been able yeah, to find I out. I bet, I, I bet. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, that video will be coming out soon. And like you were saying, you are actually coming back from That's right. this vacation finally. So <laughs> that'll be great. <laughs> Please come back. What kind of greeting will I receive from you? I don't know. Slap in the face. <laughs> it might be a slap in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, my mom is also in Asia and she is in Taiwan as well for the last part of her trip. She was in China. She was in like our hometown, obviously. Right. And she's flying back home through um, Taiwan, but she's in Taiwan right now. I'd like to introduce the third, the third her. member of this episode, your mother, who's sitting right next to me. No, I know, right? <laughs> maybe, you'll, maybe you'll run into her in the streets in the underground mall. She'd be buying like a retro game or something. Well, you said you said our flights land at like kind of the same time, so I, I might see her at the, at airport, the airport, which would be which would be, be great. So amazing! Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> give her a high five or something. <laughs> Both of you are coming back on the same day. That's so funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have one other video that's up, which. Um, this is the rare video where we came up with a fun title first and then decided what we wanted to do with it. <laughs> naked and Afraid, Underground so for Link and Tears of the Kingdom. So naked and so scared. Um, yeah, so this is a really fun challenge. We are uh, taking off all of Link's clothes and accessories, jumping into a chasm of an area in the underground in the depths that we have not explored. So completely blind, no map. And seeing if we can survive for 24 hours in the in the depths, in the dark. And it is not great, let me tell you. That is a scary place in the best of conditions, honestly, when you're in an area of the depths where you have not found any light routes. It is terrifying down there and difficult. And, uh, yeah, bad things happened. And you should watch the video because... Yeah, I don't know. I like this video a lot because it did sort of transform Tears of the Kingdom into... Like a, a survival game? game? It's yeah. like, okay, you're you're forced to work with what you can get in the moment. So it's like, I don't have any, you know, light seeds to throw down. Like, I'm, I'm literally in the dark. I have nothing. Um, so it, it definitely feels very different when you give yourself this kind of constraint. It is. And it, that that area is, like, I, I think we both had a very visceral reaction to the depths where we went down that first chasm and we were like, oh, this is not what we expected at all like this landscape this atmosphere is so different than the rest of the you know the the environments in tears of the kingdom so it's really perfect to have this type of exploration um and doing it in this way we we did it before 
we had a very similar challenge that we did in Breath of the Wild on even tide island. But I think this one's way better because the depths is just in and of itself such a creepy, scary place to be. Um, so when you add that and you, uh, this other layer of challenge, like you just never know what's going to happen down there. And That's right. some stuff happened. Some very traumatizing things happened to me. So that wasn't great. Watch the Uh-oh. Game. Uh, We are going to get into our Pikmin 4 impressions and our discussion of why Mr. Miyamoto is so obsessed with that game. But first, we've got to shout out our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Thank you. You know, sometimes you face moments in your life where there's a fork in the road and things are uncertain. We are no strangers to this kind of situation. True. We had we had each other to talk about, but this is a great case where talking to a better help therapist can help give you some some context, uh, some valuable conversation, a fresh opinion, and decide what you should do. Yeah, and there's there can be lots of types of you know life things that are happening to you that put you in the situation. It, it, you know, for us, it was career oriented. Obviously, when we had to make the choice of whether to leave or or um, leave Nintendo or stay. But there's lots of other times when you have these kinds of tough choices. It could be with your relationships, you know, with your family. It could be anything. So having someone that can really listen and help you, like, parse through um, a complicated situation like that is really important. And BetterHelp therapists are licensed. Very easy for you to talk to them. You um, fill out a very quick but in-depth questionnaire um, matches you up with a licensed therapist and then you can talk to them any way that you want to whether it is um, you know a video call or a phone call or even by text if you just want to shoot some quick message over and and see um, if someone can help you like that is a way you can get help which I think is amazing. Yes, it's very uh, convenient and flexible, wonderful way to break into the world of uh, therapy if that's something that you have been thinking about it, but just not sure entirely how to do it. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Kit and Krista today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash Kit and Krista. We'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. That's right. All right. All right. Here we go. With the games we're playing, Pikmin. So there's this big demo for Pikmin 4 out, which I have uh, played through and wrapped up. And I'm glad I did because honestly, I was not super hyped for this game. And I was like, well, maybe I'll see how the reviews are and decide if I'm going to play it. Um. And I think maybe maybe we should also just say like, you know, our sort of histories and and, and feelings on the Pikmin series. So I've played one through three. I think three is the only one that I have played through entirely. It's a series that I have really wanted to love, but have never been able to get there. Yeah, same with me. I I have played all of the Pikmin games. Um, I think I've beaten at least two and three. I don't know if I've actually finished one maybe not um it is also a series where i really appreciate the people and like the fandom around pikmin and there is a lot of charm to that game that i also recognize but i think for me i'm just not like that style of gameplay doesn't click with me but not to say that this isn't a great game and so many people love it and um, it's really different and unique and there's a lot of charm to it. So, so I think we, we, you and I are both sort of not like maybe like the, the most, you know, passionate Pikmin fan, but we both have, have had um, a lot of experience with the series and we've definitely played a lot of the series as well. Yeah. And when, this first, or when Pikmin 4 was first announced in that direct, I, I thought like, well, it looks like another one of those. And, you know, they're making some small tweaks to make it feel a little bit different. But I, I wasn't immediately seeing the big differences. But once the demo came out, I started to hear from people saying like, oh, no, this this does actually feel quite a bit different. And they have made some tweaks to sort of expand the scope of the game, but also address some of the issues that are pretty specific to the issues that you and I 
had um, with the series. So I can say, you know, after I've finished the demo, like I'm, I'm pretty hyped for the game. Honestly, um, it's it, it does feel like Pikmin's best shot to kind of break out of this niche status. Um, it, it still very much feels like a Pikmin game, but they have added and changed a lot to go beyond what it was. Yeah, I finished the demo as well. Um, and I definitely agree that there is a lot of new new things added and, and things that, you know, we've, you and I have struggled with in the past, like that sort of mechanic loop of resources versus time versus exploration that can be very constraining. They, they seem to have addressed that somewhat, especially when you're exploring like the caves that your time doesn't pass when you explore the caves, for example. I thought that was a really nice touch. The little doggy is really cute. Ochi? Ochi. Is it Ochi. Yeah. Ochi is really cute and adds like some oomph and power, I think, to the gameplay, which sometimes you feel like is a little bit like, I'm just throwing my poor little Pikmin into demise and they're just going to die. Um, so that's really nice. And then I was really surprised that you even get to create like your own little explorer character. That was really cute. Um, I was I was surprised by that. So there's gonna... definitely some elements there that... I really loved. I'm going to need to redo my created character when the full game comes out because, Hi. well, I thought I made one that looked a little bit like me, but the more I looked at it, it just looked like Conan O'Brien and it really started <laughs> to bother me. There's not a ton of options for not that. Not a ton I, of I, options. I would have liked a few more options with that, but whatever. It's like really like a minor thing. But but it has like that great expression on its face, like the little whoop. Like that. Yeah, face. I did. I did. I did do the the fish lips, which is you my gotta trademark. Do fish lips, of course. <laughs> um, so Ochi, Ochi is a really big addition, and again, one yeah, that when the Ochi. game was first revealed, like I didn't. I was like, okay, you have this weird dog thing with no nose and two legs. I don't know if I like it. What's the point? But Ochi does give you a lot of agency as the main character that you didn't have before. Like you were really just helpless throwing these Pikmin. And you're like, well, I hope they can do their thing. I, like, yeah. I didn't I didn't realize before the demo, like you can ride Ochi around, the Pikmin can mm -hmm. ride around, and you can do different sorts of attacks with Ochi, and he's pretty yeah. powerful. So I was like, oh, this is, a, this is powerful. a great addition. Well, look how big Ochi is compared to the Pikmin. So it's like times whatever strength of Pikmin, right? Right. And then the other thing that's cool about Ochi is like he has other like little, you know, traits. Do you get like sniff out things? can follow the little trail where he like sniffs out the little you know your your mission or whatever so ochi is quite the puppers with the mostest so yeah great addition we love a good puppers addition to any game so i i give it, that a, a win in my book and something with ochi that again this this is sort of where it feels like they've expanded the scope of the game is like there's kind of like an ochi <laughs> skill tree where yeah. you can choose like what path you want to go down and they were a bit vague in the demo of like how much you need to commit to one path versus the other. I don't know if eventually you can fill out the whole thing or if you oh, do really need it. to decide yeah. what you want to do, but that's great. And that gives you, you know, something to sort of aspire for and some sort of sense of, oh yes, I am getting stronger. I'm getting these new abilities. And that, that does, at least for me, like that adds a lot to the experience. Yeah, I think just feeling like you have some control over your own life that doesn't rely on a bunch of tiny Pikmin is helpful. Um, although the Pikmin are there too, and it's now you have like um, some different kinds of Pikmin as well. I, I got the ice Pikmin. Um, so it's cool that they introduced that to you quite early in, in the um, demo so you can try those out. And it's cool when you combine like the Pikmin abilities with Ochi's abilities. Like the ice Pikmin can freeze things and then you can use Ochi to like rush it and then like breaks it apart. So like the way that Ochi and the Pikmin sort of work together, I really like that. I think that's like, it's a hard thing to do when you have like your core gameplay, which is based on you throwing these Pikmin and then you add this other like big new different entity in to see if all of it kind of will mesh together. And I think they did that really, really well. And it was fun to... Um, like switch between all your different little, you know, whether it's your different kinds of Pikmin and Ochi and like use that creativity to figure out how to get through, you know, the certain levels and, and enemies and stuff. So I like that a lot. 
Two things I didn't love about Ochi. First of all, I thought it was cute that the Pikmin could sort of hang off him when he's running, but then it started to <laughs> remind me of those scenes of spiders that have their young on them. I was like, oh, uh, this is getting a little creepy for me. Uh, and then the other thing was I, I accidentally took a step into some water because I was like, can Ochi swim? And I got this like horrific, like drowning animation. <gasps> and fortunately I was able to get Ochi out, but I was like, I, I did not like that at yeah, one the, bit. The the death in the game is still pretty front and like front foremost or whatever, like in your face, I guess. And that that is another aspect of the game that's really, really, really hard for me is I don't like watching the poor Pikmin die. I don't like accidentally like doing something that causes them to die. Now that we have Ochi, I'm already like on edge because there was this one thing that I did. I was like fighting some enemy and Ochi got hurt. And then like a little message popped up. I was like, Ochi is hurt. And I was like, what do I do? I freaked out because I didn't, I actually don't know what to do. Do you give him something to make him feel so, better? So His health I, didn't go back up. Well, I had a situation where Ochi's health bar went down to zero. And I was like, <gasps> oh, is it, did Ochi bite the big one? But no. So if that happens, it just goes back to the onion and he, and it's just oh. kind of resting there for a while, oh, okay. getting its, its life back. Oh my and God. then you can pick up um, and go. So I, I was wondering about that too. It's like, am I going to okay. get a new Ochi? Like an RIP to the to Ochi. <laughs> what, What's going to happen? I thought that Ochi could eat like the little honey nectar. I was like, eat, go eat the, lick the honey nectar and get better. But he did not lick it. I think that was an item that you get later on. So you can feed Ochi this little bone to give give it some health back. Oh, thank goodness. Did you, so so the rewind is a new feature. Did you use that to, to after you lost some Pikmin to try and get them back? I I'm, did. I'm wondering if you're going to have some sort of a like fire emblem situation. I, where it's like, I need a perfect run or I'm just going to restart. It just doesn't, I can't do that. That's too hard. Like that's, I would be playing this game for like the rest of my life if that was the case. Cause there's no way to keep track of that many of them. Yeah. I guess if I had like a situation where I couldn't get, like, I, I hate the one thing I hated the most that pained me in my heart the most with Pikmin games is when like the clock runs out and you're not it back at the onion in time. And then it's like the ship go, leaves without you. And the little Pikmin are like running towards yeah. the onion. And they're like, wah, 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 wah. and then you're, <laughs> and then it says like, you've left this many behind. Right. That is the part that makes my heart like cry. So if I can rewind that, maybe I'll feel better and just try my best with like the other, the other Pikmin that are just like in the environment. I don't know. I still don't really love that. The, the fact that Ochi can get hurt. I did not put him in water. Thank God. I'm never going to do that now because that sounds horrible. I did not like that at all. At all. Like Ochi getting hurt. Well, in the, like, so in, in the, one of the trailers they put out, they showed something where it's like, oh, you can actually walk underwater. And maybe that's a power that you get later, like some upgrade. I was like, so I was like, oh, is that something I can just do out of the gate? So I took a step in the water and it was the, the awful like flailing around animation that I, that I saw. It's like, oh no, get out of there. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had to use the rewind either. Um like I've I've lost Pikmin, but it's like not not so much that I need to sweat it. I could see using it if it's like, oh, I, I really messed up and now I'm yeah. sort of hurting my chances. Right, right. Um but it's I mean it's it's nice that it's there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Still though. So cruel. <laughs> Life is so cruel. <laughs> yeah, that is the thing. Like if if you just don't like kind of conceptually like the life or Bad death idea. aspect or some of yeah. these like creepy crawlies that are the enemies. Like that's, that's my, that's that my has problem. not changed at all. Like some of these enemies yeah. are just straight up gross. Yeah. They're like bugs and like, yeah, it's not, yeah. it's not the best. Yeah. That part of it still kind of gets to me a yeah. little bit, but I do feel like, again, with Ochi's help, I do feel like I can protect the Pikmin a little bit more Be before you just, you just throw them in there and that's it. Like you don't know, control yeah. over whether or not they live or die like you kind of can but if you mess up you feel terrible like you like put them in that situation it's awful so now at least you have this like giant dog legless dog armless armless dog that can help you or whatever but i did make ochi know. fireproof which was a good upgrade when i started fighting fire enemies oh that's nice yeah like spray something on his fur <laughs> one other thing that i liked was so you know along the way you pick up these they look like little crystal Rocks. looking things yeah, crystals. and they tell you like oh well that's not the sparklium that you're looking for and but so i wondered anyway. so i wondered well why am i doing it but it those are basically consumables 
uh, or, or like currency. So you can buy little gizmos and stuff in between stages. So I bought like an exploration drone, which was very useful, which was something that I could just send out and get a view into what was out there. So I could sort of plan out what I wanted to do. But then I also found this other cool thing where there was like half of a bridge made. And normally, oh, yeah, normally, normally that, you know, you just throw your Pikmin at the thing and they build the bridge. In this case, it was like, oh, you need to spend those little bits to turn it into clay to finish the bridge. So right. I thought that was a, a nice little bit of like, oh, yeah, you have this this currency and you can decide what you want to do with it. Like mm -hmm. you can use it in the stage. You can get these these other items. I thought that was yeah. neat. Yeah, that is cool. I like that. I wasn't sure what that was for, but um, I haven't bought anything yet. So yeah. The, the other thing about this game, and they, they try to explain it to you, the, the Don Dory or whatever it is. Yeah. I'm not the best at the Don Dory, I got to say. I'm just like not a very good, I, I don't know. I'm like bad at it. You know, I cannot do it. So I feel I, dumb I, a little bit. Yeah, I <laughs> don't know why they hammer that point as much because that is a concept that I would say is not inherently fun. For exactly. most people. No. Um, it's, it's kind like of like... A, it's like a bit... It's like a work thing. It's like I'm I mean, it's, it's the same thing as like overcooked, where it's like I'm thinking nine steps ahead and, you know, I'm multitasking like crazy. So I... Yeah, I do think that's a bit of a strange concept for them to push as much as they do. Like, I, ne I never really got that feeling of like, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed with things to do or, or thinking nine steps ahead. So I, I was like, maybe, maybe just don't talk about this, guys. <laughs> yeah, but they really like want you to know about it. Like yeah. they really in the tutorial, they're like, "You do you know what this is? This is what this means." And the definition they give you is like the boringest thing you've ever read in your life. It's, it's like, like some like, Japanese like work it's efficiency like, concept. It's yeah, as if you were were like working in like a factory. Right, and right, like, right. No, I don't. I don't like this. This yeah. is not fun. I want to have fun playing video game. So and then like again, and it made me like feel kind of bad a little bit because i was like oh, i'm not doing it i'm not doing that i'm not efficient yeah, yeah. or multi -tab. i'm not doing any of that i'm just like walking around with these pigment and this dog like oh am i doing this wrong like it kind of made me feel a little bit bad i guess so i mean i don't know like this is like very early in the game i hope it doesn't like ratchet up to a point where i really need to be good at this concept and i just can't be um so that was one thing that i was like oh i hope it doesn't like become too hard or something like, you know, be too serious with that. The demo is pretty talky at points. Like the mm -hmm. first 30 or so minutes, like I was getting kind of annoyed because I would, I would feel like I was like, okay, now I get to do the thing. <clears throat> and then they would like break in with some other tutorial. Yeah. And that, that was actually a comment we heard a lot from our, from our Patreon subscribers um, when they were talking about the game was like, it'd be nice to just be able to skip that if you're already pretty in the know or, Maybe they should just find a, a better way to not have to talk you to death. Um, fortunately, after you got, I felt that after I got to a certain point, I was just able to play. And it's neat how it's just like a big, a pretty big open area that you can yeah. do kind of whatever you want. Um, I'm sure there's things that you did that I didn't do and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty big area, and I do love like the scale of everything. Like, even in the very beginning, when you go into that house, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so little compared to like these little, you know, this like inside of this house or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So that scaling is always fun in a Pikmin game and it's it's awesome to see it. Like, so it's so beautiful. Um, but yeah, I do think that Nintendo's not great at the tutorials. They always feel like, I always feel like they treat every game in a franchise as is, as if it's your first one ever. Even like when we're playing Tears of the Kingdom, like, yes, you don't need to tell me. I, yes, I understand. Thank you. Um, but like this game too, it's like they tell you, you know, all of the basics. And yeah, if you were a Pikmin player, you know, before three games ago, or you played all three games leading up to this, you probably don't need to be handheld that much. And if only they can just say like skip tutorial or something. Um, I think it would be nice to recognize that people have sort of different different skill levels when they enter into a game like this and customize that a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So this game's coming out pretty soon. Again, I, you know, it really, the demo really sort of changed my impression. I I'm, I'm not entirely certain like how this game is going to do though. Like 
it is a series that's been around for 20 years. Like people have largely made up their minds to some extent. And yeah. it took me playing the demo, like taking that step to actually download it and play it to really see for myself what had changed and, and what was different. So I, I, I don't think this is going to be one of those like, oh, you know, the series completely changed its fortune now that it's on Switch and, you know, they took kind of a different approach. But I, I, I do think it will expand what this series was in a good way for the future. Yeah, I think it still feels pretty niche. Yeah. Um, it's just inherent, I think, in the gameplay. You know, this kind of game, especially when they're hammering concepts like Don Dory <laughs> to the player, like this type of game just is a, it requires a certain type of person that likes the style of gameplay. And sure, it has, it, it certainly has like the, you know, Miyamoto Nintendo charm. And there's been so many cool additions that, you know, we both saw on the demo. But at the end of the day, I think the core gameplay will, will be what keeps people or, you know, attracts people or converts people or not. Um, I love this demo. I thought it was great, but I don't know. I, I still don't feel like it's a game that I can play. Like, I don't know if I want to play the full game. I don't know if I, it would, you know, hold my attention. I, I like the demo. I thought it was cute, you know, but I'm not like jumping on the game day, day one for sure. I'm, I'm probably going to keep that maybe as like a oh I'll maybe, i might play that later if i have time yeah yeah i think so, for me it, it was kind of some of the things they had done to modernize <laughs> it and also like keep you engaged like that skill tree like that sort of thing um to feel like you do you are slowly getting more powerful was um cool yeah. for me so yeah Beautiful. i think i think there'll be a variety of opinions and um we did ask our patreon subscribers in a poll because i was very curious because we have we have a lot of people who are diehard fans in our community, we have people who are like us. We have people who have never played a Pikmin. So I was curious to find out like what people thought. So the poll was, um, if you played it, which of these options describes how you feel about it? So 68% said, I love Pikmin and I love the demo. 18% said, I don't really like Pikmin and I also don't like the demo. So kind of staying where they were on that position. 13% said, I don't really like Pikmin, but I'm loving this demo. I put myself in that category. Yeah. And then 1%, the lone 1% said, I love Pikmin, but I don't like the demo. Oh. So that kind of speaks to what you were saying of, yes, it's a very good version of Pikmin. It will probably somewhat expand um, what this series has been, but it's it's not going to be like this life-changing thing where it's like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden Pikmin's like the hottest thing in the world. It won't be like Fire Emblem Awakening. Right, 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 right. That's the that's the game that I point to always, where it's like a very niche audience with a niche t gameplay style, but all of a sudden it was like this turn. Yeah, I don't think that will happen here. Right, could be wrong, but I don't think so. Yeah, so let's talk about this series and, and Mr. Miyamoto because this is always a thought that I have when a new Pikmin game comes out yeah. is kind of how obsessed he is with Pikmin and, and has been over the years, and like there have been a lot of times. Um, where I've wondered, like, would we still be getting Pikmin games if he was not right. the brainchild of this series and, you yeah. know, the most important developer in Nintendo where people give him this certain amount of leeway to do his thing? I feel like if it was somebody else, they may be like, okay, we this has run its course. We it's gotta, not, we gotta, like, it's not taking it off. Let's, let's, let's do something else. Absolutely. I think it 100% has to do with Mr. Miyamoto's personal just passion for this series. And, and I, I, I want to dig into this with you a bit more because I thought about this a lot and we obviously interacted with Mr. Miyamoto a lot and sat in a lot of his interviews where he does talk about Pikmin and we have like that, seen it in action. We have seen it in action, but <clears throat> I do wonder like what it is specifically about the series that is so important to him. We know that one thing that he loves is when like life imitates art like, for example, he always talks about, like, Nintendo dogs, And he was like, yeah, I got a dog that year. I, like, literally got a puppy. And this puppy was, like, ridiculous and crazy. So I made Nintendo dogs because it was fun, you know? Like, to watch this, like, puppy, like, roll around in my house and, like, chew stuff. So he's very much, like, that type of developer. Like, he, he pulls a lot of ins his inspirations from his daily life. So I'm like, what is it about this that, what are you, what are you trying to 
channel here because it has a cute charming like maybe we're in the garden kind of quality to it but it also has a kind of a morbid like we're all gonna die quality to it as well so i just i'm really curious about his thought process behind it well i think that's one thing where he has this personal connection to the concept but i think for me i think it's something else where if you are him literally everything that you have created in your career has turned to gold except for this yeah and i think that must like keep him up at night where it's like surely like i i can fix this so it's just like we just keep getting pikmin games it's like oh this is the one this is the one and none of them are ever the one Mm -hmm. and nobody's really in a position again to say like hey why don't you spend the time that you would spend on a pikmin on something else (laughs) which i think just gives him this like laser focus on like yeah. i'm gonna do this i can do it i'm miyamoto He's looking in the mirror every day i'm miyamoto i'm gonna do, <laughs> do this you know who i am <laughs> do you know who i am throwing a pikmin against you're gonna wall. like a pikmin <laughs> yeah that's so true it's like the one thing in your career that hasn't been like the world's biggest hit ever like everything he does almost become... yeah literally every other thing no i think not almost literally yes every, this is like the one if 99 percent of the things yeah, he did. He did turn to gold and was became mega popular and made billions of dollars. And then the one thing he just can't seem seem to like get it to stick. And I I do think that's why he's always like trying to attach himself to it too. Because it's like, remember me? You like me? I'm Miyamoto. I made right. Mario, Zelda, and all these other things that you love. Why don't you love this too? Um, exactly. So he does that, that a lot. Yeah. So he goes out of his way to be the face of the series. Like like that weird segment that we had in that last direct oh, where the, the game Bloom. was eventually announced. We talked about Pikmin Bloom. He's wearing the Pikmin shirt. Eventually yeah. it's like a 10 minute segment all about Pikmin where yeah. he's like, I will, I will personally do the work to deliver this news because it will be the most impactful and gives this all the best chance of success. He's not doing that for anything else no, at this point. No, he's not. Even like little Pikmin Easter eggs, like when we went to Universal. Yes. Like no world. Like he's very much like in the weeds of all that creative development for Super Nintendo World. And guess what? Guess what he puts in there? Pikmin! Yeah, it's, <laughs> They're it's everywhere. pretty much like a 99% Mario experience. Except for those handful Pikmin. of Pikmin that yeah. you can find, which again, if anybody else was creatively designing that park, those yeah. things would not be there. Exactly. Right. I also wonder if he like really wants this like obscure, I don't know if I should call it obscure because it really isn't. The gameplay is not like his usual style of gameplay. Like Mario games are very like, it's very easy and you just like breeze through like platforming whatever you know it's like very quick and easy and stuff like that this one takes a little bit for you to like understand how like the intricacies and the beauty of the gameplay and like how that all works and you know i, I also wonder if he's like from a, a game development standpoint he's like i just really want to like make this type of gameplay that's not very traditional and not very easy at first brush to understand just like make it happen you know if anyone can do it i can because i'm miyamoto but yeah. it's hard i think he, i mean maybe he's finally seeing like it's pretty hard you know yeah so i just jotted down a couple sort of connect the dots examples of things that have happened over the years and it's been a long time at this point gamecube game was when it first came out so yeah. you know i found some interviews from when the first game was coming out on gamecube and he's like yeah i want pikmin to be the next mario so that's just saying it out loud like yeah, I think yeah. this has the potential to become the biggest, you know, new IP in gaming. Obviously it didn't happen. I think that may have been, uh, you know, a far-fetched thing to uh, think in the first place. But, th- I mean, that that's how he was feeling about it. Right. 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 And then, I mean, this happened a number of times. Like, and he's, and he's, you know, known for this. Like, in an interview just kind of out of the blue mentioning some little detail about something that's unannounced or that he's kind of going off script for. Like there were a lot of times where he said like, Oh, by the way, the next Pikmin game coming soon. (laughs) Yeah. What? what? (laughs) We weren't even talking about that. That was his favorite thing to drop in these interviews. We would joke around about this. We would do prep meetings with him and we would say, are you going to announce the next Pikmin game as like a surprise to us? And he'd be like, ha 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 ha. And then he would totally do it. Right. <laughs> what is going right. on? 
Yeah, that that was always like a warning sign when people started to take these things into their own hands and kind of go beyond yeah. the broader Nintendo marketing plan or communications plan where it's like, I, I need to do this thing or it's not going to go as well as I think. And there's like other yeah. examples of this. There's some where other like, examples of where this. Pe- where like people who are like individually invested in some project will just like retweet some some tweet like as if it makes any difference at all. Right. Like, oh, no, oh, now right. I've done it. Now, it'll, now, now, it'll be now I'm going to make this a big hit. I'm going to make <laughs> right. it a big hit. I did my <laughs> exactly. job. Exactly. But or some people die on the sword of like the worst game ever. You yeah. Know? Like they exactly. Just, because they were the ones that like convinced people to, to, to do this. They're like, no, I have to like make this. Code work. name Steam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that um, way. <laughs> the other thing was, so these these Pikmin short films are really interesting. So I was with him in, he came to New York to do a series of interviews for, of all things, the Year of Luigi. And that was where he started talking about, again, unprompted during these interviews for the Year of Luigi, the, the Pikmin short films. And he actually showed them to us kind of in progress when we were there. And... This was kind of the start of him getting into this world of movies. Right. Like you could tell that this was this was kind of becoming the next thing that he was going to be interested in, want to get into. But he was kind of trying to find the right way to do it because at that point, you know, Nintendo was not really doing anything outside of games. So I was like, well, I'm going to make these short movies and we're going to show them at like a film festival. And I think in Japan, they actually did, you know, run them. Like screenings and stuff. Yeah. Right, right. And ahead of actual movies. So again, they weren't doing this with Mario. They weren't doing this with Zelda. It was kind of like, yeah, I'm just going to do this on the side, wink, wink. But it became this obsession. So on one hand, it's great that it, it, this led him to get, gave him this very basic experience of making movies of making animated movies that, you know, I think carried over to some extent right. to the Mario movie. But at the time it was like, again, like, why are you, why are you doing this? <laughs> was a lot yeah. of the feeling. Yeah. And we weren't really sure like what to do with it either. I think we had like uploaded them maybe to the, our YouTube channel or something like that. But it was like a lot of, to me, it felt like just a lot of um, resources and work and time that he put into something that there wasn't sort of a clear plan for you know what why they existed right except for the sheer fact that he wanted to do it you know right and then the other thing that's that's kind of in that same category is is pikmin bloom where and we have some niantic news later on in this episode you're like Mm. things are not going that great for niantic outside of pokemon go and you know this does not strike me as the next big hit ar game and i don't think it has been and i think a lot of this is nintendo keeping this propped up um, but you know, again, you saw him talking about it in that Nintendo Direct. People were baffled by that. Like he just yeah. seems to want to make this a thing, and sees you know, I think he sees this as like, oh, well, maybe this is the way that I can broaden the audience to bring people exactly. into the 100%. game. One hundred percent. I don't think so it you is. You try everything. Yeah, you try everything. You try right. the they they can you strike lightning again with Niantic's Pokemon Go with Pikmin Bloom? Maybe try it. You know. Try it with the resources that, you know, you're able to try it with. But obviously that that didn't seem to happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it does seem like, you know, he personally has done just just about everything <laughs> to make this into a thing. Um, but, yeah, well, I mean, we'll see with this new one if it becomes a thing. Like, I think people that love this style of gameplay – would absolutely and they haven't tried this game yet like would absolutely love this game it's so so charming and it does have the miyamoto like signature in it like if you look for those types of creative unique like kind of off the wall kind of stuff it is in these games um but you you really have to be like bought into this gameplay because or else it, it becomes pretty hard i think to to stay on yeah. So again, like, you know, I think we like this game. I think it's a good step for the series, but it, it is just amazing to look back at like the 20 or so years of his personal investment and creative energy, you know, the greatest, you know, creator in games that we've ever had trying to make this thing a hit and not entirely getting there. It's just, it's just a fascinating, like, it's fun yeah. for us to play armchair psychologist. Like I'm sure like a real psychologist could, could say something about that too. 
Yeah, yeah. I hope he's yeah. okay. I hope he doesn't take it too hard, you know. Well, he's got the 99 other great hits and the billion dollars from the it Mario movie. doesn't movies. matter. So, <laughs> oh, my God. I, I can The one totally thing see- keeping him up. I can see him though. Like he's that type of person. Yeah. Like he is one of that one of those like, you know, extraordinarily he has a very high bar for himself clearly. <laughs> um and I can see him being like really annoyed or like just like disappointed that it's not like the next Mario, right? Yeah. So I hope he's doing okay. Like think about the other 99% Mr. Miyamoto, you're amazing. Yeah. Um but yeah, and I I for him for his sake I really hope this is a hit. Like, I hope this is a huge, this is it. Let's put the good vibes out there for his sake. Just, just because we want him to be happy. Until Pikmin 5. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the next Mario movie is actually They're going to keep coming Pikmin until somebody, movie. until this gets it big. Yeah. <laughs> Forget Zelda. We're going to go, go straight yeah. to the Pikmin movie next. Right. Illumination, get ready. <laughs> um. So you, we have both been playing some new games, but I think we also want to check in on what's going on with you in Final Fantasy 16. Yeah, Final Fantasy 16 continues to be a feast for the eyes. It's beautiful. You know, everyone is hot. That's another thing that's been great. Um, Yeah, I have made some significant progress now. I've really gotten to know the characters really well. There was a big story twist that, like, like one second before they revealed it, I like totally called it. I was like, oh my God, is that X, Y, Z? And then it totally was. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Um, And now, you know, Clive has a lot of internal struggle that he's dealing with after he finds out what actually happens, um, what actually is going on. There's like a lot of some, some really heavy topics, honestly, that have been, that come to light. Um, that's really sad. And the story takes a very like, like we got to make this right kind of mood, you know? So that's been really great to just kind of unravel. The game has not fallen apart for me. I still am enjoying it very story much. Story-wise. Story-wise, it's, it's great so far. Um, Gameplay-wise, though, I will say that it continues to be a lot of like, wow, this looks real pretty, but I'm not really doing um, so I do feel like it's in service of it looking like really spectacular. I did, I did this like for real boss fight recently. And while it was challenging, it also was very spectacle focused. So you're, you're just like grinding through this long boss fight, you know, and it's like, is your stuff, are these combos doing the damage that you want it to do? Or is it for some other reason of it looking nice? I don't know. Um, so and I you're kinda, still... You're still on the combat focused um, difficulty. Mm-hmm. Has it been yeah. challenging? No. Huh. Not at all. Not for me. I don't know. That's Maybe so interesting that they made such a big deal out of that. <clears throat> and at least so far, like that doesn't, the difficulty doesn't seem to really be a thing. No. Huh. It really, yeah, it hasn't been hard or anything like that. Like that boss was pretty hard. Like I, I definitely use some potions, you know? Um, and and I, I had to, like, learn some of its moves to, like, counter it and stuff like that. But I do think they've really just prioritized the fact of making it look really spectacular over your actual gameplay. Like, actual you controlling the character. Um, which is fine. You know, not every game has to be, like, this precise whatever. You know, you could just enjoy the game for the story, which is exactly what I'm doing. I'm not going to, like, let this distract me from that. I, I come to Final Fantasy games for the story, so I, I'm fine. I'm just saying, like, it's you, it's very interesting that, that this is just such a sort of, like, a gloss over of this gameplay. Like, you're just playing it for, I guess you're watching a movie <laughs> or something, you know? And it, it's okay. Um so yeah, so it's been going good. I feel like something else big is going to happen. There have been more small council meetings um, with a lot of Game of Thrones looking characters. There has been some vows of vengeance because certain things happened, and <laughs> things are about to go down. I think things are going to, are going to get pretty bad soon. Um, but yeah, yeah. So far, it's it's been great. I, I really like it a lot. Hmm. I continue to waffle 
on my big decision of when I get back of what is the big game I'm going to pick up, especially now that Pikmin is in the mix for later in the month, or be it Final Fantasy or Star Wars or that. I just don't know. Oh, boy. I'll play it by yeah. ear when I get back. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. You're going to have to make some decisions. When you get I know. Home. Yeah. Uh, another game you've been playing is Ghost Trick, which. Oh, my God, Ghost Trick. Is a game I heard of when it first came out, and I know a lot of people love, but I still don't exactly know what it is. I missed this game, so this is my first time playing, and I am a little ashamed to admit that, honestly, because I'm, okay. a noted, I'm a noted Ace Attorney fangirl. Like, I absolutely love and have played almost all of the Ace Attorney games. Um, you know, this is the same developer as the Ace Attorney games. Um same same director um and it definitely has that similar style but i honestly like i don't know if it's been a while since i played ac attorney game or something but i really like this a lot like maybe even a little tiny bit more than ace attorney because ace attorney games i know this is one of the things that you don't really love about ace attorney games is that you're you feel like you have to listen to a lot of dialogue and you're like three steps ahead of the solution before they ever get to the solution and you already know the answer I dandorried the heck out of this case. Oh, the dandorried. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Um, but this game is a lot faster paced. So it feels like a quicker, faster paced Ace Attorney game. You still get the great, like, gasp worthy story, which I definitely gasped a lot of times when I was playing this game. Like, there were so many twists. And I was just like, oh my, what? It's so crazy. And, you know, you're, you are. Um, you are playing like in the same genre, like you're like a detective. So you're still kind of in that ace attorney genre of like solving a case and finding the clues and all that stuff. So if you like that kind of stuff, you'll love Ghost Trick. But the premise of the game is pretty simple. You died and your little ghost orb can inhabit um, inanimate objects. And you have to use that to figure out why you died. And you have to use it to save people from dying that are part of your story. So what it, the game does is like really clever. It basically lets you watch how they die. And then you get to rewind the clock by four minutes. So four minutes before their death. And then you have to figure out like what you can manipulate in the um, environment around you to make it so that they can avoid dying. And it's on a timer. So it's like you got four minutes to figure this out. Um, and you're like kind of jetting around the the room, like trying to have a different object, seeing like the different things that you can do to um, try to save this person. You know, like one person was like about to get smushed by like a wrecking ball. You have to like find a way to like move the wrecking ball out of the way so it like smushes something else, you know, like things like that. So it's super fun. I think I'm getting close to the end because I'm like oh, the already story's starting to wrap up. I play the crap out of this game. It's wow. So okay. It's so good so good um and i'm just so bummed that like there's no more ghost trick where are they where is the more ghost trick games i guess it's hard for them to make this but uh, yeah i, I mean it's it's more. great that they are are putting this out again because i i think it didn't do super great when it first came out it's like a cult classic yeah um, and i think this is one of the games that disappeared with the eShop closing so i think this was a ds game Oh, a DS game. A okay. DS game. So even before then. Um, so yeah, it's also got like a good bit of age on it as well. Yeah. So good on Capcom for understanding, you know, people love this game and it's another another shot. And it looks fantastic on Switch. Really? Like it looks so good. The colors are so vibrant. It oh. has this like really cool, like it, it. you can see the Ace Attorney signature because obviously it's from the same director, but it has like this really great, like almost like early 2000s cartoon, Disney Channel cartoon vibe to it. Like, I don't know if people have watched the cartoon, like Johnny Bravo or like Kim Possible. Um, that's exactly what it looked like to me. Kim Possible is yeah. another one that reminds me of that. Like that's what, and the main character looks a lot like Johnny Bravo. Um, but that's what it reminds me of. And it's like so nostalgic, like that style. And oh, it's so good. And it's funny. Like, they, I mean, there's like a whole thing that takes place in a giant chicken restaurant. I don't know. You guys can play this It's so good. <laughs> it's so, 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 I cannot stress enough how much I love this game and how everyone should play it because it's amazing. Wow. So good. So good. Overwhelmingly positive. 
Okay. 10 out of 10. Oh my god. 9 gosh. out of 10 for Tears of the Kingdom. Put it on 10 the box. 10 out of 10. Put it on the box, Capcom. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, from a chicken restaurant to a sushi restaurant, there's one more thing we want to talk about. Uh, it's a game I've been playing on Steam Deck while I've been uh, out of home. It's called Dave the Diver. So this mm. is a game that I've had on my wish list since I got the Steam Deck. It's been in early access for a while, and they finally just did the proper release. Um, I I struggled for a while to... I was like, what kind of game is this? Because in all the videos they put out, it looks like really well done and fun, but they, they blow through a lot of different genres in a short amount of time. So I'm like, I don't know what this game is. So I'll just kind of walk you through the concept and the stuff that you do. So basically, you are Dave, who is an undersea diver, and you work for this sushi restaurant in this random, like, tropical island. And the loop, so everything is broken into days. So the loop of the day is you go diving, uh, which is, like, 2D diving, and you catch the fish. So you have a spear gun. Um, you have a knife for harvesting things off of the ground. And all of that is procedurally done. So every time you go, it's a little bit different. And you can get upgrades to your spear gun and your equipment, or you can get mm -hmm. like a little thing which will help you swim faster. Uh, but every time you come out of the water, it's reset and you go back to your, sort of your base equipment. So there is a bit of randomness to the stuff that you're getting and the things that it's you can like do. It's like Hades. It is. They, they, it, they call it's that like part you get, yeah. a little bit rogue, rogue light. -y. Rogue like, yeah. Um, so that's the first thing you do. And so you gather stuff to go into the restaurant and that, that's fun. Like exploring the water is different. Um, some of the fish will attack you. So you need to either avoid them or take them out to get away from them. And um, I am slowly upgrading my ability to go deeper into the water. Ooh. So there's different types of fish. Like the vibe changes as you go deeper. Like I'm still going pretty shallow. I think like once you get super deep, it gets kind of scary. So that's the first thing you do. Then you go into the restaurant where it becomes almost this like restaurant management sim, which is something that I have like, so just so people know, like I don't love overcooked because I find it yeah. stressful. Somehow this has made it not stressful um, oh, okay. in, in ways that I struggle to fully explain because there are times where you're doing a lot of the same stuff. So basically you can all you can manage the economics of it. Like you're setting the menu, like, oh, like, oh, well, this is priced at this much, or this is a popular item. So I'm going to do more of this. So you set the menu based on the fish that you have and the recipes that you know how to make. And then it goes into like serving, like, like the dinner, the actual like dinner time. And people like you're, you're literally t picking something up from the chef and taking it to them, or you're like serving them tea. Um, and everything is you know, you know, like, if you wait too long, people will get upset. So I, I haven't really had the same frustrations or stress with that that I have with Overcooked. Again, for reasons I can't completely explain, I think it's maybe just slightly more low-key yeah. than that. Um, but that's the, been fun. Not as frantic as it is in Overcooked, where the right, whole right. entire gameplay is like based on as frantic as possible. Like that's yeah, the whole point yeah. of it. Yeah. So then you do the night and you see like how much money you made. And then it kind of goes into this kind of again, back into the semi part of things where it's like, well, do you want to hire a new employee with the money? Or do you want to do an upgrade to your restaurant to make it more appealing? Or you can also look at like, they, they made basically like a fake Instagram where you can see like how people are talking about your restaurant <laughs> with like, with like fake little posts. And it's, it's like really well done. Like they did a really good job of imitating <laughs> Instagram and you can like, like the posts and, and do all that stuff. Oh my Goodness. And once so you get cute. a certain amount of social media clout, like your restaurant can expand. Oh, um, so I there's a lot the to this game. And there's also kind of like a through line story that is really fun. Like this game just has like a good kind of low key vibe. Cause again, you're set off in this like tropical Island. So it's like, yeah, we're, we're doing this restaurant, but it's like, it, it doesn't feel like this life or life or death thing. It's like, yeah, we're having a good time doing this <laughs> restaurant. So I really like it. It again, it's very hard to describe the genre. It's it's like a big mashup of a lot of different things. Um, I've been enjoying it a lot. The the one thing that I will say is a bit 
like anachronistic with the vibe of, of some of the other things that you're doing is like, you are like hardcore, like hunting down these fish oh. and like, you know, you shoot them with the spear gun, like blood shoots oh, out the spear gun. or oh, like, blood one, shoots or like out. one of the things that you have to do, or one of, one of the items that the chef wants to serve is like, um, it's like a shark head. It's like a roasted shark head, which is literally a shark head on a platter. Oh, and it's no. like, you, you have to like basically get a gun to shoot the shark and kill it. So it's like, Mm. this is maybe a bit out of line with the tone of some of the other parts of the game, but it's like to bash the, the fish on with a club. No, club like no, but life. it's like, it's like, yeah, well, this is where sushi comes from, but it it's is true. very, it is very like in your, it's very unabashed about like that, that side of things. So if people are like squeamish or don't, or don't like that sort of, sort of it, I did not like taking down that shark, but I had to do it because I love sharks. Um, so I just, just Yikes. putting that out there just so people know. But um, otherwise, I, I, I'm really liking this game a lot. Um, and I think that's that might be the game that I really hunker down and play a lot on uh, the plane ride back, which is like quite long. like macabre games of like death and <laughs> the circle the, of life. The, the creatures. Whoa. It's the circle of life. Let me live in denial. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's also the Steam sale, the big Steam summer sale is happening right I know. now. So I'm I I am accumulating. So many games. That's a question that we have for our bonus Q&A for this week, which is what are, what are yeah. some of the games I'm looking at for the Steam sale? So I'll be nice. answering that there. Um, but we can go ahead and jump forward to the news. But first, let's shout out our other sponsor for this episode, which is Factor. Thank you, Factor. We are in the thick of summer. I imagine a lot of people are looking for wholesome, convenient uh, meals that they can have to support their active life out in the sun in this beautiful summer weather. That's right. You are probably going to be re very reliant on your factor meals when you get home from your long vacation. Am I ever? You're not going to have time to go grocery shopping. These meals come packed, ready to go. They're not frozen. They are easy to prepare. You just microwave them for two minutes and they're ready to go. And there's tons of recipes. And uh, yeah, I think that this is perfect when you're coming back from a long trip or, or doing some meal planning. You know, you're going to be busy. Um, for for your work week that week, this is a great option. That's right. You told me once you get off that plane, you better be ready to podcast, boy. So I am not going to have time to go to the supermarket or anything else like that. Uh, I am going to have a big factor order lined up just so I can uh, take it easy and get back into the swing of things. But yes, every week there's like 30 plus different options. So there's so much variety. And yeah, it's ready to go. You just put it in the microwave and uh, you're all set. And we have been eating this stuff and it all tastes really good. So, so good. That's uh, the best part of it's it. Really, yeah, really good. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so head to factor75.com slash Kit and Krista50 and use code Kit and Krista50 to get 50% off. That's code Kit and Krista50 at factor75.com slash Kit and Krista50 to get 50% off. That is a lot of percents off. The link That's will right. be here and in the description below. Yeah. All right, let's get into our news. All right, we're leading off the news with the latest on the Microsoft FTC trial, which has Boy. wrapped up by now. I would, I think it, we, we were wondering like what kind of bombshells would be coming out this last week. I wouldn't say there were as many as the first week, but there were some interesting little bits to, to talk about. Yeah, there's more Nintendo stuff, I think, in this second part of it. Um, there were some interesting jabs <laughs> from from all of these people that are a part of this and and also someone that we both worked with was deposed um about i'm assuming you know nintendo's place in all of this nintendo's you know place in the in the market as well but yeah it's it is inter it is interesting i think the biggest thing that comes out came out for this is like how these other companies see Nintendo. Like how do they see them? How do they view them? Um, so that part was enlightening. Yeah, the deposition from the Nintendo person was sealed, which means people don't get to see it because it probably has a lot of <clears throat> highly confidential stuff in there. Um, that person, Steve Singer, who's the head of Nintendo of America's sort of licensing team. Mm -hmm. So, and it, you know, he would be the right person to talk about this stuff. But yeah, it seems like one of the main themes was asking both Microsoft and Sony whether Nintendo and the Switch is a competitor. And there was a lot of different 
mental gymnastics happening and <laughs> just some some strange answers to that question, I thought. Yeah. I, I wonder why, though. Like, you know, I think the one that's really interesting was when when asked the, the PlayStation um, person whether Nintendo was in competitor, they, they, they outright said no. Um, we don't see them as a competitor uh, because of just the sheer power of the Switch doesn't really match up to the power of Xbox and of PS5. And they they sort of like did this weird song dance around like the audience for Nintendo is like very, very different than the audience for, you know, PlayStation or um, Xbox, which I don't know if it's actually true, you know, like sure, Nintendo has a history of more family friendly games, but I don't know. I feel like there could be more overlap than they make it out to be. Like like last week, you have to wonder, mm -hmm. like, you know, people want to position, these companies want to position themselves in a way that serves their interest in this case. That's how we got that whole line of like, oh, we've lost the console wars and, and that whole discussion. I think in this case, I wonder if these companies don't feel like the Nintendo topic could just be a whole other can of worms that they just want to stay away, away from. from. Yeah. So they're just like, yeah, that's something else. Like we're in the same industry, but we're not really going head to head. When everybody knows, like, yes, you are all going one hundred percent head to head. Are. I mean, not not to the degree that that Sony and Microsoft <clears throat> are, but yeah, you're, there, there's definitely people who have made a buying decision of like, I can buy one of the three. Which one will I buy? Right. Right. Exactly. So it is very strange that there was this kind of like almost like active avoidance of any Nintendo topics or just 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 trying really hard by both companies to make it it you know not be a topic of conversation at all, you know, in this in this in these proceedings or whatever. So. Yeah, so so the Microsoft reasoning was that they are misaligned with this generational hardware cycle right. that um, Microsoft and Sony are very in lockstep with each other on. And then, yeah, the PlayStation answer uh, from Jim Ryan. We, we sometimes take jabs at Jim Ryan. I really like him for being just like very no nonsense about this stuff. Yeah. He is gaming's Gordon Ramsay in, in more than just looks. Oh, boy. Uh, but That's he's like, yeah, they, yeah job. they they cannot, um, you know, their hardware can't play our games. So, you know, as, as, yeah. as far as it's us being the premium, <laughs> most technologically advanced uh, entity in video games, like, no, they're not. So I kind of buy his answer more than the Microsoft one, especially since currently there's a, you know, they have had this crossover strategy of, of bringing their games right. to Nintendo as, as a means of their audience expansion strategies so yeah in this case i think you know the no nonsense jim ryan answer actually holds more water yeah it does and i, I love how they were like when asked about the audience and like whether or not nintendo's for kids he like definitely danced around it like he was like i'm not going there <laughs> right, right no way yeah yeah and then and then jim ryan had another little jab um that he snuck in of like you're like why do you think call of duty is so popular in in america or something like that and he's like well it involves shooting and they love guns over there. He had something like that that he yeah. was saying. So yeah. you gotta, gotta stick the knife wherever you can in this case. You gotta, I mean, you gotta do something. It's really <laughs> terrible to have to sit and be just ask the questions to pose like all day long like that. It's probably just right. awful. Like a lot, not a lot of people can probably handle that. So good on So you. the case is over. There was at the end a lot of, and people were reporting on this, that the actual judge was asking a lot of questions right. to kind of get at, kind of get around a lot of the fluff. Yeah. And, um, Is that typical? Yeah, I think in this case, they're able to, okay. to ask at the end um, to, to clarify for themselves, you know, what their position is. It seemed a lot of people, I, I, there's still people arguing both sides of like who had the better case. There seemed to be a lot of people who felt like Microsoft made a better case of itself than the FTC did. And I think based on the questions from the judge, 
th- those seem to be a more a bit more pointed towards the FTC of like, is this really serving the reason the FTC exists? Um, yeah. You know, of, of protecting the consumer and not just protecting corporations. Right. I don't know if that's indicative of the case overall. So, uh, you know, it sounds like we're going to get a ruling soon. Again, they have to, I think they have a deadline or else they have to kind of restart a lot of this whole process. Oh my gosh, you cannot restart. That will be a big bombshell. And then I believe, I I could be wrong in this, but I believe there's still Mm. the work they had to do. Remember in the the UK. That's right. uh, That was the other. Did they resolve that? I think they may have resolved part of it. Yeah, I need to double triple check that. But in any case, we're getting close to something. (laughs) happening on this trial whatever it is oh maybe remains gosh. to be seen at this point I, i'm sure they're just like just give us the decision like anyway it, like it's better than the waiting you know sometimes the waiting is the worst part so i'm sure everyone's just ready to hear what the final decision yeah. will be do you yeah. think they're going to be okay do you think microsoft is going to be able to do this i think the mic i think the microsoft side will win i i never thought that the case against it was that strong yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it'll go through despite all the strong opposition that, that Sony um, has put up. I, I think the case is, and, and you know, there, there does seem to be a lot of lingering resentment around Microsoft. I think if this was another company who was doing it, it might, you know, they might not have run into all of these roadblocks, but yeah. I, I do think it will eventually go in their favor. Yeah. 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 I do too. I, I think we just need to put it past us and move forward. Yeah. So there's just one other news story we want to talk about this week, which was one that I I didn't see too many people talking about this, uh, but it's around Niantic, as we were saying at the top. So they've they've closed a studio that they had in L.A. Yeah. And they laid off um, 230 employees, which is really quite a significant. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite significant. I mean, maybe there's just so many kind of tech layoffs lately that it's just like, oh, just one more of these. But um, there was this kind of leaked email Mm. from John Hankey where he was talking about how, you know, the company grew, like, again, like like a lot of other companies really grew in the pandemic, but it kind of put them into this unsustainable place. And now they have to undo a lot of, um, you know, the growth oriented changes that they did for the company um, during the pandemic. So they, you know, they did recommit to Pokemon Go, you know, wanting to make that a game that they can support forever. But as far as all of their other projects, like, they're really like slashing a, a lot of those. And, yeah. you know, they do, they have like a Monster Hunter one that's coming up. Obviously, Pikmin Bloom is still going. Mm-hmm. There's like I, a Marvel one. As have well, they too. had... Another hit beyond no. Pokemon Go, like one of these no. that has no. worked. I mean, even I mean, obviously nothing will be as big as Pokemon Go, but even just been like something that is no. popular enough to sustain it. Nope. I think the other answer is they're the game that they made before Pokemon Go Ingress. I think Ingress. that still does have a community, but it's amazing that the rush post Pokemon Go and all of the great IP that they got really didn't result in anything. Yeah, it's such a weird phenomenon. That's the thing about phenomenons. It only happens in a very specific, you know, with very specific circumstances. And that was just the the cards lined up for them for this. And and it just goes to show that it's a shot in the dark. You don't know, you know, yet. Yeah, I mean, Pokemon's probably their most, <clears throat> like, well known IP, for sure. I don't think any of the other things that they have has had that level of cachet and, and mass appeal. But even so, you know, things that they did with like the NBA didn't take off, like things that they did with Marvel didn't, I mean, like they have Harry Potter, they had lots of IP that were really popular, but it's just one of those lightning in the bottle kind of situations that you can't predict. I'm not aware of any other (laughs) companies that are focused on AR games the way they are. That's another interesting thing about this is like, after Pokemon Go, like there were no competitors to them who could crop up. I mean, maybe you maybe you need some technology that they have, some knowledge that they have to really do it that just other companies can't replicate. That seems strange to me. The other thing is, like, it is hard. Like, if these games kind of strike me as an MMO where it's like you can really only play one of these at a time, 
unless you're unless you're yeah. going to be like the wacky guy out there with 19 with the phones 15 phones yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like the grandpa who's got 19 phones on a bicycle yeah. playing mm. pokemon go yeah. uh, because it literally does like it requires your full attention on the one phone that you have yeah. so i don't know what their expectation was it was just like oh we're, we're just going to saturate all these ips and and we will find the game that works for all of these different audiences i, I don't know yeah. just it's the genre itself seems very hard to expand the way they did right unless the gameplay is something vastly different but if the gameplay is similar to that of pokemon go um for all of their other projects that they're doing and pikmin bloom is pretty similar where you are like required to you know do the walking outside to collect the things like it's very similar to that pokemon go loop i feel like it would be really hard for you to try to multitask all of those games you know that would be pretty tough yeah, I, I do think Nintendo is just, you know, bankrolling Pikmin Bloom at this point. I think if it was another company, it probably yeah. would have been shut down. But you wonder, I like, how so. long are they going to do this? Are they going to do it forever? Or are they got I mean, because obviously when you shut these these games down, it does become like a big, like, admission of like, oh, yeah, this didn't Failure. work out yeah. the way that we wanted. And, and again, this is not the time to do anything like that for, for Pikmin. I was going to say, like, don't rock the boat right don't now. Don't do it Pikmin. now. But, yeah, yeah. I wonder... You know, maybe in between Pikmin games, they they, they quietly just pull the plug quietly. on it or yeah. what? Or do they just stick it like, we're going to grit our teeth and pay for this as long as it takes. Maybe they have enough money to do that. And, and well, obviously they do, but. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't feel good. You know, it doesn't no, feel good to, right, right. to be in that position. And it doesn't feel good for Niantic to be in that position either. It's like you've tried sort of in vain to have your next hit but it just hasn't come you know yeah because and eventually we... let's go ahead i was gonna do we know like what the player base right now for pokemon go is like obviously we were all playing like everybody in this entire world we were all playing pokemon go at one point but you and i have stopped playing i i, I would yeah. imagine a lot of people have fallen off like what is their current install base for this is it still yeah, i think they do release numbers big? for that semi-regularly and i think they did get a big surge in the pandemic because i mean they totally changed the way that you could play that game without That's having right, to go yeah. out but I, I think it has dropped off um more recently but i think it's still quite quite big okay yeah so they so, yeah, can sustain with yeah that. they can definitely keep that going yeah so that's the news for this week, kind of a light news week, but sometimes that's just how it goes. So let's get into questions from our Patreon community. Uh, and like we said, in addition to this Q&A, we do a bonus Q&A exclusive to Patreon if you're interested in signing up and checking that out. Let's get started with our first question from Cerulean Dragon. Hey, you two, one more Zelda question. Now that you've finished Tears of the Kingdom, how do you feel about the $70 price tag? Did it feel worth it to you? Now that the rest of Nintendo's games for the year have been priced at $60, do you think Tears of the Kingdom is justified in being Nintendo's only $70 game? I do think in terms of scale, like how big Tears of the Kingdom was and just like how many hours, you know, we've all played the game, like just from that, sh that only that formula of like scale versus price, I would say $70 is justified. Um, that game is massive. You know, it is a huge game. I've done so much in this game, um, but I still have yet to 100% complete the game. So I do think from that perspective of just hours of enjoyment, if you just divide $70 by, you know, 155 hours, like that's, that's okay. That's not bad, you know, for the hours of enjoyment that you, that you've had. Um, so I, I would say, yes, it was worth the $70. I agree. I have no problem with that price tag. Um, yeah, it seems like there there may not be another game on Switch that hits seventy dollars. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if once we get into the next generation, that becomes the, the standard price, price for yeah, everything. Um, I'll just be curious. You know, uh, some people have pointed out like the the storage of the game card, like the physical, um, you know, uh, size of of the chip that you need to contain it can play a factor in that too. So I'll be curious to see um, what happens with that in the next generation. But yeah, I mean, this is just a, a game that's unlike any other Nintendo game out there um, in terms of how big it is, in terms of, I'm sure, the, the development resources that it required. So yeah, I, I, I had no problem with that. Jay Rando's next. 
Hackett and Krista, Nintendo has released a number of collector's editions over the past few years. We've seen them for Metroid Dread, Fire Emblem Engage, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Tears of the Kingdom, etc. I noticed that Mario games made by Nintendo did not seem to get a collector's edition. I was hoping to see one for the recently announced Super Mario Brothers <laughs> Wonder or Super Mario RPG. I feel like big fans of the series would love to have extra goodies like an art book or soundtrack with Mario games. Is there a reason Nintendo does not make collector's editions for Mario games? Have we made any collector's edition? I'm trying to think back. I believe there was like the red joy Kong for Odyssey. Um, yeah, but that's that was, was not a, a version not of a, the game. Not a version of the game. There was some some of the some of the. Um, like Super Mario All Stars, like those like anniversary editions, have some collectors editions. Well, because they um, did the, the limited. The answer to this is no. Okay, <laughs> you're, so you're those, those your don't brain. count. Those don't so, count. I, then? No, I think like right. like something where there's like a base edition and then there's like a big box that has you know, a statue okay. or, all right. or something else. All right, a statue. We need a statue. Yeah. We need some. We need some postcards. We need, we need some, some stickers. Magnets, we need some magnets. pins, magnets. Mm -hmm. Put those right on your refrigerator. Yeah, um, they should. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, you know, there is a trend of the games that they do these collector's editions for, and they are the ones that have the more, quote, like, hardcore gamer fan bases, exactly. which is, I think, how they look at it. So, like, yeah, Fire Emblem, mm -hmm. Metroid, yeah. Xenoblade. I don't know why you couldn't do it for a game like Mario, though, because I think, yeah. like... That game is for everybody, which includes those same people who are buying games like Xenoblade yeah. or Fire Emblem. So I don't completely know the rationale for that. And it seems like a way they could squeeze some extra bucks out of releasing these games. So, yeah, maybe in the future they can reevaluate that. I feel like every time, single time we launch a Mario game the mentality and the priorities shift really significantly towards like, what are the things that we can do that would be, be the biggest, you know, impact for getting that new player or that expanded audience. So they really just like brush aside all of these tried and true things that usually work for other games like collector's editions or, you know, characters or different skins and stuff like that that the stuff that the kind of bread and butter you know stuff that works typically for um other more like hardcore games or whatever core games um so i, I feel like that might be part of it and, and that's why maybe we've, we've only seen sort of like anniversary type collector's editions because it's like oh this is a, an opportunity to celebrate mario um that everybody will remember because it's like it's a significant milestone, you know, for that franchise or something like that. So, the counter argument to yeah. what I just said, and now I'm going to argue with myself, is <laughs> there is already so much Mario stuff out there. It's like, do you really need to get Mario stickers through the game? Or can you just go out and buy those Mario stickers? <laughs> and I'm sure that there will be some amount of dedicated Mario Wonder merch out there. So yeah. maybe maybe that's just how they look at like this is such a big franchise like hey Xenoblade fans there's not going to be a lot of other Xenoblade stuff beyond the games here's your chance yeah. to get it so maybe that's, that's another way of looking at it I still think they could do those if they made something exclusive and special to put in a, in a limited edition but maybe they don't see the need I don't know nobody ever the Gino Amiibo don't start with that where don't is get, it the people are going to get too mad Gino Amiibo for Smash. Put it on a Smash Brothers base. Put Smash. Put, oh, put Gino in the Smash Brothers game. It's more than a. It's more than a DLC costume or a me, uh, more than a me costume. Why don't you think of that? Assist trophy. <laughs> That'll get them going. <laughs> uh oh. Uh, our next question is also about uh, Mario RPG <clears throat> from Pidge Zero One. Uh, I've got a question surrounding the Super Mario RPG remake. The gaming community's reception to this game's reveal has been explosive, to put it lightly. It's been very interesting that we're seeing a return to Super Mario RPG in 2023, especially when the game isn't celebrating a milestone birthday or anything like that. Fans have been loudly clamoring for a return to Super Mario RPG since the early 2000s, and the Geno for Smash campaign has been notoriously popular, but nothing ever came of it. It does feel like this reveal has come out of nowhere. 
My question is, do you have any insights as to why at this point in time, 27 years later, was the right time to revisit the game and no sooner? From your time at Nintendo, do you know if there were any rumblings about this game being possibility before now? Was Square really not being open or cooperative to the idea of their characters being used in another game? Or was it just speculation? Or was it always a possibility on the table, but just deprioritized in favor of other projects? Thanks for your consideration. So many scenarios. So many scenarios. Well, I think the thing with Nintendo is that their library is so deep, you know, like anything could be on the table for consideration in terms of a remake. You know, then they, they do this. They look at it in we, we joke around about this a lot, but this whole idea of like, what can we do? What can we dig up from the past to get people excited about our upcoming game that we want to be a hit? That's why we were all predicting to no avail that, you know, they were going to launch like the Wind Waker remake in the lead up to Tears of the Kingdom because we were like, oh, what a great way to like, quote, warm up marketing the people so they can get into the Zelda mindset and get ready for Tears of the Kingdom, which is a game they wanted to be a hit. So in this case, I think very much it is very, it's like, you know, what can we do now that will get people into the Mario game mindset? capitalize on the fervor from the Mario movie and all of that great, you know, new fans that that movie has brought in and get people excited for wonder. Um, that's pretty easy for us to do. And, and I think that's why the timing for this game is, is what it is. I had a similar thought initially when the rumors for this started to go around of like, boy, that would be out of nowhere. But then you do realize that we have not seen a Mario and Luigi game on switch and that developer who was making the Mario and Luigi games basically closed down. Yes. So I, I wonder if there is just a moment of transition with that series where they're trying to find a new team or some sort of a new direction where it's, I think the scope would need to be a little bit bigger than, you know, that the handheld dedicated series. So I wonder if this is just like, we're putting out something that is like that, that that fan base will enjoy to give us the time to do what we need to do with that other series, because there are a lot of similarities there. They are distinct things, but there are some similarities in terms of the gameplay, in terms of how the characters are treated. Uh, and it becomes this, this nice bonus as well, while people wait for the next Mario and Luigi. Yeah. I want the next Mario and Luigi very badly. So <laughs> please, please bring one to switch. In the meantime, I think you're going to love this game. I, I really want I really want to see your reaction to this game when you finally get to play it. I have high hopes. I can't wait to play this game. Everyone has really set my expectations up for this. What if you hate Gino after all this? Not Gino for I think you might like Mallow better. I keep, I'm just going to keep saying this so that you're not shocked when it happens. Do you think I won't like Gino? Do you think I won't like Gino? Um, maybe I like Mallow a little bit better. Maybe that's maybe oh, that's the whole hidden agenda to all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta look a little bit deeper. Follow the money. Um, Tuscoop <laughs> has the next question. Hi, Kit and Krista. Do you personally see a future for the Xbox platform after they've admitted to, quote, losing the console wars for two generations straight? In their shoes, would you give it one more college try and try to make the Xbox brand boom with a pivot slash one last generation? Or would you hunker down and focus on just what's working? Game Pass, thank you for your insight. Well, like you were saying, I, I don't think they actually think they lost. I think that they are definitely saying this for the courtroom to, to make sure that the you know their case goes their way. I mean, there might be a, a, some little nuggets of admittance that you know they, there have been a bit of a struggle for the last you know couple of generations and they're trying to get their way back on the up and up um i do feel like and we talked about this a little bit after the whole announcement season like i do feel like they're feeling pretty good about themselves after all of their you know um recent announcements in the showcase and people seem really happy with what they have coming up so I wouldn't say they're like, we're losers. Let's shut this thing down. Um, I think they want the case to go their way, but they, they probably are feeling relatively confident about their future. So I don't know if they, they need to like do anything right now, honestly. 
at a at a company as big as Microsoft, there's usually some sort of a hidden or not spoken about benefit to these projects that spread out to other teams. Unless something is like a complete and utter flop that you just need to pull the plug on. So, yeah. you know, with, with the last generation um, Xbox One, like they talked about the cloud and that was a big initiative for Microsoft overall then. Um, you know, now Microsoft is getting very deep into artificial intelligence. You wonder, like, is there something between the games unit and the artificial? Like, is there is there some interplay there? Obviously, it's a great foothold into the entertainment world, which is a good place for all of these um, big tech companies to be. So I, I think there's more to it than just the like, oh, Xbox lost money again kind of storylines, because I think Microsoft gets a lot out of it in terms of training up different parts of their business or different areas of technology that can be moved around. We saw this with um, uh, Stadia, where, you know, in, now now they're talking about, oh, you, they're testing that you can play games within YouTube. Like, clearly, that's a Stadia-oriented technology that now mm -hmm. they're they're moving around. So we see that a lot. I do think, though, they will continue to move away from the physical console eventually. I don't know when exactly the right generation for that is, but that seems to be the writing on the wall with what they're doing with Game Pass and um, the cloud play. It's obviously not something that they could do now, but I do think they would like to just make it a service where which, with whatever device you want, you could tap into this huge library of games. And I think that could be could be a cool niche for them. Yeah, I think that's the thing that they need to do right now is actually find their like unique, you know, niche or we used to call it, right, this is Reggie's words, Reggie used to call it a unique value proposition. And we would talk about that, like what is Nintendo Switch's unique value proposition it was very easy to describe that to somebody. You can say it in one sentence. So Microsoft needs to do some work and figure out what theirs is, you know, and be able to have them, you know, have like ownership over that one thing that makes them different from, you know, the other gaming competitor, the other yeah. gaming companies. So I think that's what they need to do. But I think they're they're set up to succeed here. You know, they have a lot of great IP. They're making some really good strides and changes. Hopefully, they get that ship back on track. And yeah, I have a lot of faith in their future. I think I think it's going to be good. It's going to be okay. And especially if the deal goes through and you've bought Activision for a kajillion dollars, you're not stopping then. Exactly. You got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, definitely can't stop after yeah. that. My Oops. Uh, who is Bowser Jr.'s mom has the last question. Dear Kit and Krista, if we are inevitably headed to an all digital future for console games, why are we not there already? Whatever the reasons are that people like physical media, won't those same reasons still exist in two or three generations from now? Personally, I like having the option. Yeah, I think it's hard. I think physical media has been such a, like, especially in games. Like, I feel this, like... Yeah, it is the last holdout, kind it's of. It's the last holdout, because, like, mo movies, we, now we're all movies, streaming Movies, we've moved everything. on. Music, we've yeah. moved on. Although you bought the Mari movie on Blu-ray, so there's that. Um, it was the first time in a long time, though. Yeah, so there, but there is like that, like collector's aspect to it. But games is like, there's there's something about the now we're getting real philosophical or like psych, psychological. But I feel like armchair psychiatrist feel like there's something to a connective tissue between a physical game and that you're physically playing it that has like some weird like link in your brain that you can't undo like un unlike a movie which is a very passive activity like you put in a blu-ray you watch the movie like you stream a movie you watch the movie you don't there's nothing different there but like there's something about the idea of like you are physically controlling a character with your two hands that you put like a game that's physically that you can hold in your hands like i don't know i feel like there's some weird like psychological thing there that we can't shake i agree with that and i also think there's just a mistrust that has been the creation of all these gaming companies, you know, weird decisions with backwards compatibility. Because you never know, am I going to be able to play this in the future? Am I not? I don't know. 
so I, I, I don't fault anybody who's like, yeah, I need to have this because otherwise, you know, they're going to pull the plug on the eShop or they're not going to have backwards compatibility. And then my thing is going to, you know, what if my hardware breaks? There's a million different scenarios on that. Whereas it's like, I can watch a, a DVD I had from 20 years ago on like, on any like current Blu-ray player. Like, I don't have to worry about that. I mean, I guess with music, they just stop making the hardware altogether. So now you have this like combo of like, oh, people are into vinyl. Now people are into cassettes. It's like, like me. This, it's, you're into cassettes now? You've moved no, on I'm to into cassettes? Vinyl. I'm into oh, vinyl. Okay. <laughs> so that's kind of in its own place. But yeah, I think, I think a lot of this is the creation of the game industry itself, not, uh, you know, really picking and choosing what they want to do with backwards compatibility. Nobody feels good about, yeah, has assurance about this huge library that they have. So it's that's so on them. And that yeah. stinks. And there, there's also just this endless <clears throat> symbiotic relationship with these retailers that I think elongates yeah. this cycle where I think a lot of the platform holders would love to do this. And now we have, you know, digital only PlayStation and Xbox. But it's like, we, oh, we need to wait for the retailers to catch up or they're going to be mad and they're going to pull the support. So gift cards. Right. Gotta so it's like the gift cards. It's like, yeah, you can buy something digital at a GameStop, but I don't know why anybody would ever want to do that. It's like at some yeah. point you just need to rip the band-aid because it's silly. Well, the retail situation is not looking good overall right. in the world. So at some point that's just gonna go away. And you're not gonna be able to. You're you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna have that option to contend with in the first place. The whole thing about just trusting the platforms on like whether or not your game will be available to you like in two or three generations or whatever because of their practices of backwards compatibility is a real legit worry. I think some people, especially gamers, um, have this need to just like hold on to an old game. You know, I don't know why. It's It's, again, very different than like a DVD or something like that. Some people are more like, once I played it, I'm good, you know? Um, I will put myself into the second camp. Yeah, look at look it, at I'm you good. very vaguely making these comments about me and you. I don't How know. Dare I'm you? Just saying, I'm just, I know just who you're weird. talking about. It's, it's me. A, it, it's an interesting examination of your psyche, though, it is, is this conversation about, like, what you're – what having this game means to you. Like, why do you think you need to have this game that you're probably never going to play again? Like, why do you think you need that? You know, and then like on the other side, it's like, well, like some people are just like, I'm good. Like I play this game. I did what I needed to do. Like, I don't care. I'm good. You know, I don't know. Is this is interesting. That's all. No judgment. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot of different variations on it. Um, it's, it's impossible to have one single answer. But yeah, it, it is a very uncomfortable transition that I think nobody is making. Nobody in the industry is making easier, unfortunately. Yeah, we need like a yeah. industry wide cloud storage solution. Do that. Uh, again, the power of the cloud will solve all our problems. That's right. <laughs> Phil Spencer <laughs> loves that answer. The cloud. <laughs> yes. The cloud, though. Which one? We don't know. All right. That is all of our questions and our answers. Time to shout out some Patreon superstars, our wonderful Patreon superstars tier. Yeah. Let's get started with Aaron Hash, Ben Icorn. Maru Mayhem. Eigenverse. Kiss My Flapjack. Mike Chin. Mr. Rogers. Roy Eschke. Switching It Up. Underscore. Safazon. The Shark Among Men. VGM Life. Link, the Hero of Winds. Angela Bycroft. And her pig Molly. Ugh. You forgot Molly twice. Uh-oh. Um, Turbocharged Nerd. Thomas O'Rourke. Kyle LaBeouf. Christopher Lara. Simon. Frederick Ulf Conrads. And Andrew Uhans. Woohoo! All right. One Up Club ready? is next. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. A Ron Burgundy. Adam and Ansley. Ajan Malari. Ale Alejandro. Alexandra Pratt. Astro Dev. Bed Moon Horizon. Ben GB. Hook 'em, Dano. Brad SF 56. Brooke Obscura. Brookie Kazooie. Bruce Dash. Chelly Squirrel. Christopher Lay. Captain Alex. Crib Cat. C Roper 17. Daniel Cold. Daniel Phillips. Dachshund. Dolce. Dino Punch. 
Elite Peach. Elix 790, or 780, whoa. Aspar's 50. Farpree 69. Fairbound. Fernie and Jess forever. Fox Deploy. Fred Rossi. Garrett Hullfish. Garf the Wolf. Gartooth. G Sun 101. Ian Shea. Iris Marin. J Rando. Jabroni Jones. JBJ. Jeffrey Hernandez. Jerry 92602. Jesse Hernandez. John Responte. Jonathan Rowe. Jordan Collette. Jordan Hemmerly. Joseph DeHayes. Joshua Clements. Juji Fruit. Just Camtro. Justin Leminger. Cairo Trigger. Kawa2796. Keith Kwan. Kelpshake. Kevin Delane. Kilo Kiba. Christopia Party With Me. You forgot Krisu! Oh my god, Krisu! Oh. It's all thrown off. Now I'm going Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie. Kyle Kretzer. Kyler Nelson. Lanelle Stickman. Lennis Sullivan. Lit. Mad Dog 5981. Marky Man 64. Mecha Dragon 101. Megan. Michael Cravens. Mikey. Motomania. Mr. Andy Pong. Mr. Beans and Dip. Amazon Poke Gamer. My Tram. Nasir. Nathan Burkhart. Nick E. Ninja Eleven. Panda Buns. Pangy. Palsy Pace. Fall Gale Network. Prime Factor. Prince Charmless. Raver. Rain Tech. Renee Rivers. RJ Kern. Rob Osborne. Rocks. Ryanetta. Sam Nealon. Sharif Jackson. Shinry. Slowbro. Shrews. Silly Ferret. SJ Sharky Triple Seven. Spicy Munchkin. Steel Citrone. Tales of Link. Tech Magic. Terra Storm. Thomas Alvarez. Tover Schmofer. Travis Torline. Tugs Puppy Bear. Tuscoob. Tyler Geis. Vesves. Video Game Stupid. Virtual Bot. Weeb Kingdom. Wicked Davy. Will Johnson. Zudaverf. Zelgaroth. Zapati. And Zroid. Zelgaroth, Zapati, and Zroid have formed the Z Force. It's basically the Triforce, <laughs> but with Z. FYI. I wonder. Z Force? The, the Z Force. <laughs> FYI. Okay. <laughs> just, Good to just know. Your information. Uh, there um, is some exciting and fun things afoot on Patreon, which we will talk more about. Uh, next week, we are part of one of these early trial things that Patreon is doing. Thank you again, Patreon, for doing that. We'll talk about it more next week, but if you want to poke around on our page, it's already up. That's a little tease if you want to take a look. I had really a moment of like, what are you talking what about? What are you talking and then, about? And then and then I realized what you were talking about like 20 seconds in. I was like, oh, yeah, that thing. Also, next week, we're going to be in the same room together. I won't stand <sighs> for any more of this nonsense. I can finally slap you when I feel like it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> You're gonna I want to hold on to this. I want to hold on to this cartridge for the rest of my life. Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm going to slap it out of your I hand. Dare you, dare you subtweet me when I'm six inches away. I'm going to shove it in the garbage disposal and then what are you going to do? No. Hmm? Yes. All right. Please help us by subscribing to patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. You are keeping this going. Kit will, will need your your contributions to come back from Taiwan. Please join us. Don't make us. me hitchhike back. It's a long he's way. Gonna, he's going to have to ride like a camel back. So <laughs> you better you better get going. Um, yeah. What else have you got to say to these people? If you're watching this podcast on video, you can go ahead and subscribe to the Kit and Krista YouTube channel. Give this video a thumbs up and also leave us a comment. We read them all. If you are listening on audio, you can also go ahead and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating and also leave a written review, please. Please. And also follow us on socials. We are Kit and Krista on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. I have to return my key to the social channels probably in the next couple of days. So follow now while the getting is good. You're and are going to go buck wild while you can. <laughs> while the tweets <laughs> are at its hottest. The Instagram reels are at their realest follow because it's gonna get I, I reviewed get i reviewed a mario movie um breakfast oh, roll bro, brioche brioche bun. roll please please uh check that out yes, yes. taste <laughs> test all right that is it 